listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project with your host, Rob Skiba. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight we're going to uh, continue uh, dealing with a topic that may just be the mother that gave birth to the mother load of all conspiracies. That, of course, being the flat earth controversy that I've been covering for a number of months now, actually. <laughs> I can't believe I've been doing a series since uh, April, I guess. But um, my guest tonight is uh, somebody that I was actually surprised that uh, he went and jumped on the bandwagon too. And uh, I happened to catch a couple of his radio broadcasts and saw that he was looking into it and uh, was taking pretty firm stance on it. My guest is Zen Garcia. He's the webmaster of the truth-seeking network called Fallen, FallenAngels.tv, whose motto is, The seeker of lost paradise may seem a fool to those who have never sought the other worlds. He also hosts a show on Revolution Radio, not to be confused with the Revolutionary Radio Project, <laughs> also on Wednesday nights uh, from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on Studio B. He's the author of seven books, Look Somewhere Different, When the Evening Dies, A Different Way of Being, Lucifer, Father of Cain, Awaken to the New World Order, Sons of God, Who We Are, Why We Are Here, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny, and the Aramaic and Palestinian Targums. And you can find his books at zengarcia.com, as well as lulu.com, and of course, amazon.com. His radio shows are on, uh, he's got one on Blog Talk, blogtalkradio.com, forward slash Fallen Angels TV, and also on freedomslips.com. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project, not for the first time, he's been on my show before when I was on Blog Talk Radio, but for the first time here on Truth Frequency Radio Network. Zen, are you there, sir? I am, brother, and it's a great honor to join you, and um, I applaud you and all of your efforts because you have been on the forefront of this topic, and you have done fantastic shows, um, really single-handedly just dismantling the whole globe theory and all of the, um, you know, the lies and the deception that are being perpetuated by NASA and uh, with your background um, in in showing, you know, step by step um, how they have perpetuated this lie. It, it's it really is. You you should be applauded for all your efforts. Well, thanks, brother. I appreciate that. I, I you know, I I have been on record as saying, look, I I'm just I got a website called Testing the Globe because that's all I'm doing. I'm a questioning globalist at this point, and I've been looking for that that one solid piece of evidence that's indisputable before I will commit to saying, okay, yeah, I'm a flat earther. I mean, people who have looked at my website, they watch my videos, they they're all convinced I'm a flat earther. I'm like, look, guys. I'm still testing this. I haven't found that one solid piece. I've found a whole lot of what I consider to be extremely compelling uh, evidences to look at. But I thought I had it, man. With that video of the the moon going across the earth, I thought for sure that was the one. But uh, I did some tests here in my office this week and I had to actually put a video out <laughs> called the Rob Skiba Debunks Rob Skiba. I had to debunk myself yeah. on it. But, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating topic. Um to say the least, but it's also very exciting, and, and I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about it because I listened to, I think, three or f I must have been probably four episodes that you did on the subject, and I was, uh, I was really intrigued that uh, you were on it. So uh, before we go there, let's give a little bit more of your background, though, for the sake of my listeners here that uh, probably haven't heard you on my other show. Uh, just give us a little bit more of your background other than what I, I read in your bio, if you would. Um, well, I've been seeking truth ever since I was young, um, and when uh, when I was 24 years old, I acquired a disability that really gave me the time to study and look at scriptures in a way that I never had prior. And uh, up until that point, I had been involved in reading much of what is the New Age and Sumerian mythology and all the Zachariah Sitchin books and I was involved in shamanism at the time and 
doing sweat lodges and things of that nature. But um, I was brought full circle back to the scriptures, read them again with new eyes, um, started reading all of the extra biblical, extra canonical texts, everything that I could get my hands on. And, and, you know, the internet was new at that time. And all you had to do was type in uh, a word to search out and get so much um, as far as results and gain access to all of these different books I had never heard about. And so I started reading all this material and in the process of doing that, I kept having these different themes present themselves to me and they were things that were not being discussed or talked about, um, things that I did not learn when I went to Sunday school and um, that the mainstream church was not talking about. And so I decided to um, collect all this information and started sharing it um, on radio programs. I was invited to be a guest a number of times. And then after I began doing my own broadcast in 2008, um, a lot of my listeners started asking me for the material that I had um, to, so that they could look at it with, for their own research purposes. And I decided then to compile them into into books. And I've been um, publishing books on Christian themes ever since 2010. And I, I basically woke up to the New World Order and the whole conspiracy side of reality after the events of 9-11, I think it was 2004, um, that I really started digging deep into all of what you can find on the internet and realized that uh, the official story had been a lie and that what we were being told um, was not based on truth, that uh, much of what was being pushed as the official story was propaganda. And, and so what made my show and my work unique was that I was able to tie together the conspiratorial side of what's going on with the New World Order and with the biblical and prophetic side of um, the gospel, as well as tying together the ancient mysteries and the Sumerian, Sumerian mythologies and um, the study of ancient texts from uh, around the world, because I, I study it all, and um, seeing the underlying theme of truth behind all of these things, I put it together kind of as a puzzle and then wrote about it and presented this information um, in the different books that I've written up until this point. And um, now this, my latest book, the one that I just sent you the manuscript on, um, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch, that's the latest installment of going down the rabbit hole and um, <laughs> trying to find truth. Yeah, it sounds like we took a, a very similar path, and it's it's. I think that's what happens to people as soon as they are, their eyes are open to nine eleven. That's sort of like the gateway, <laughs> because right. as soon as you go through that and you have this paradigm shattered, that wow, you know, I haven't been told the truth. That there are people out there who are, are lying to us on a regular basis, and that evil really does exist. And uh, you know, as the saying goes, "I've seen the enemy, and it's us." That's that's pretty frightening. Uh, and you start looking into these things and realize, wow, it is all tied together. And and inevitably, you're right. The Sumerian stuff comes up. The Babylonian stuff definitely comes up. The, the Egyptian myths, Osiris, all that comes up. And you see that there is um, a Luciferian agenda at work. And uh, the fallen angels are, are very active and have been for thousands of years doing things uh, in this world. And most recently, though... We found ourselves stumbling on this subject of the flat earth. Now, what was it? Now, people who have listened to me know that I listened to a, a radio show that was done by uh, Basil and Gons called Canary Cry. They interviewed Mark Sargent, and that was sort of my introduction to the whole thing. What was yours? My listeners kept emailing me <laughs> flat earth videos. <laughs> and for the longest time, 
I would just have, I didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. I didn't even want to look into it. Didn't want to give any time to it because um, with with my disability, um, I try to use the time that I'm sitting in my wheelchair to be as productive as I can. Sure. And so I don't like to waste time. Um, I try to accomplish tasks that I can't do when I'm not sitting. And so I work on my books while I'm sitting up or I do research or <clears throat> I go outside and I read biblical texts, anything to be productive in, in that regard. And so uh, for the longest time, I avoided it. And then my listeners and some of my um, closest confidants, some of my friends who are also broadcasters, they told me that there's something to it and that I had always pushed that we should be open-minded on hmm. topics and not have you know any kind of uh, judgmental bias without doing any kind of research into it and and so I had to either prove myself a hypocrite <laughs> or open myself to the possibility of the flat earth and so I went into the debate with open eyes and decided to give it a few days and after three or four it wasn't long at all <clears throat> I realized that there was something more to it yeah. and and that, yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I found myself um, looking at more than just the videos that they had sent me. And I started clicking on all the recommended links uh, on YouTube and um, found myself really going down the rabbit hole deeply. Yeah, um, I, I remember listening to uh, the show you, where you, you sort of just kind of came out. I was like, you know what? This is, this is what the evidence is showing, and I've, I've got to take a look at it. And like you, I've, I've, built, I've built my entire ministry on saying that the Bible is the source of truth and that we can take it literally. And I had people on my Facebook page hounding me for – it had to be at least two months. Look into this, look into it. I'm like, what, this is <laughs> – are you kidding me? This is 21st century Right. Really? We're doing this now? I mean, seriously? And I blew it off, I blew it off, I blew it off. And then somebody – they just laid the gauntlet down and said, okay, Rob, prove it. <clears throat> prove we're on a globe. And I thought that that would be so easy to do. It, you know, it should have been really easy to do in my mind. But as soon as I began to actually look into this stuff, <clears throat> it, particularly the, the various pictures, the photographs of the earth, that we've all seen the pictures and, you know, that's what we will point to. And you start looking into it and realize it's either paintings or or composite images, or completely fraudulent, or questionable at best, um, you start thinking, well, you know, maybe there's something to it. And what I should have done first, I actually did second, and that was consult the scriptures. And, man, as soon as I went there, and I tried, I, I really did try to go to the scriptures without preconceived biases. And as if, I, in other words, we all have this bias of the globe since kindergarten. We've seen the thing. Um and so you read the scriptures with this with this preconceived notion, and you sort of manipulate and twist the scriptures into a pretzel to fit your preconceived notions. And I did my best to try not to do that. I, I thought, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with the text. I'm gonna be honest with myself. I'm just gonna read it, come to it fresh, as if I've never heard of the globe. I know nothing about the globe. I'm, I'm, what does the text say? And brother, when I did that. I, I was stuck at that point because I'm, I'm like, from Genesis to Revelation, it's a flat earth book. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I, I did the same thing as you. I, um, I, you know, instead of referring to the scriptures first, I looked at the NASA material and having discovered that, you know, they basically faked that they had um, seen the earth as a, as a globe, using the the lunar module window, um, and and other deceptions, and when I realized that they were trying to trick us into believing a certain way, well, after that, of course, I went to um, started looking at the scriptures, and also 
the same thing as when you went to the beach and you were looking at the horizon and yeah um and realized that there was no curvature and trying to prove curvature and how how is it possible that you know being able to see chicago across uh was it lake michigan or yeah. i mean seeing the statue of liberty um the buildings being straight up and down and not leaning away from you uh, all of that proved to me that there was no curvature uh and then things like um the you know reading about cannonballs being shot and how they go the same distance there's no movement to the earth and uh, even though you know there's the whole thing with the coriolis effect um yeah. it's still when somebody jumps out of an airplane a parachutist or um, you know, a hot air balloonist when they lift off from the Earth, the Earth isn't spinning away from them at a thousand thirty-seven, you know, point five one four six 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 six. I don't know if you've seen that, but no. there's all these six 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 numbers involved in the mathematics, yeah. which support the um, the globe theory as well, and that to me signifies uh, the sinister nature of the forces that are aligned against the flat earth revelation and so all of these things together and then my study of, as you have um, using the Strong's Concordance to really look at um, Isaiah chapter 40 things like Psalms 19 uh, with the tabernacle of the sun and then the the one that just absolutely blew my mind and locked me into understanding the the model of the world as being a, a flat circular plane was when I revisited um, the Book of Enoch, the courses on the heavenly luminaries, which I, I, I heard a show where you were talking about how you were working on a project where you were um, deciphering the, the Book of Enoch and adding a lot of yeah. uh, footnotes and that you had stopped at that particular yeah. You know, I believe it's chapter seven, 71 where um, it, it starts, but I went back and started to read because I had read the Book of Enoch several times, and I never understood the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. It, it didn't make sense to me, and I realize now that it didn't make sense because I was trying to um, apply the descriptions of the motions of the sun and the moon as Enoch describes it, to the globe. Yeah. And it just does not work that way. And then, so when I realized that um, the flat earth was key for unlocking the the book of Enoch, I stopped what I was doing, because I was at that point working on a, a book on the war in heavens, and I was almost really done with it. Um, but when I realized that the flat earth was the key for unlocking the book of Enoch and that the reason people did not understand his description of the motions of the sun was because we were trying to apply it to the globe, you know, the whole model of the globe. Uh, I, that's when I began working on the book that I just released. Um, I published it yesterday on Rosh Hashanah, but, um, and, and so that's the manuscript that I sent to you and, and it, this is the only way to make sense of what Enoch is describing. And this, again, applies back to several things in the Bible, like when Joshua, um, you know, the Most High gave him the power to stop the, the sun and the moon, yeah. which that would not make sense if you think that the earth is um, rotating and orbiting the sun. Why would why wouldn't Joshua demand or command the Earth and the Moon to stop in their motion? What why would he command the Sun and the Moon if it's the Earth that is spinning that keeps the Sun from going down uh, at sunset? Um, and the same thing with the Book of Enoch. Why would Enoch spend all these chapters describing the motion of the the Sun and the Moon? and not the earth and the moon, because there's zero chapters describing the motion of the earth. And, you know, when you understand that it's the sun and the moon which 
rotate and revolve above the circle of the Earth, then all of that completely makes sense. And then it makes um, complete sense why Joshua was given the power by the Most High to stop the sun and the moon. Because it would be the stopping the sun in its mid-revolution that keeps it from leaving, um, reaching the vanishing point and, you know, disappearing for the day. And so all of those things made sense when I applied the flat earth to uh, the study of the, of the book on the courses of the heavenly luminary. You know, <clears throat> they say in real estate that uh, the, the key to real estate, you know, is location, 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 right? And I have heard it said that when it comes to biblical hermeneutics, you know, studying the scriptures, it's context, context, context. You know, every, you have to. The only way you can truly understand the scriptures or really anything is what's the context. And it is clear, crystal clear to me, that the context that the entire ancient Near East, at least, if not the entire world, whatever shape it may be, uh, the, the the context that from which they operated was in the context of the snow globe model, basically the the circular Earth under a dome, and. Yeah, you're right. I, I had been through the book of Enoch many times myself with all the Nephilim research, and I know you've done a lot of similar research. So right. that, that's the source book for that kind of stuff, really. I mean, it, there's so much information there. But same thing, uh, as soon as you get to about chapter 72, and it starts describing not just the, the, the course of the sun and moon, but all the heavenly luminaries and just the setup of the earth itself, when you're stuck in a sort of a Carl Sagan, uh, Stephen Hawking view of the, of the cosmos— uh, and none of that makes any sense. And I had decided, you know, when I published my book, uh, Genesis and the Synchronized Biblically Endorsed Extra Biblical Text, uh, I wrote an introduction to that book. And in the introduction, I said that I was working on a standalone version of the Book of Enoch that I was going to annotate and write commentary to and everything. And I had gone through most of it and, and written extensive notes. But you're right, I stopped. This was a little over a year ago. I stopped at chapter 71, I dog-eared the page, put it aside, I got sidetracked with some other work, and then when I started looking into this flat earth thing, I did the same thing you said. I said, you know, I'm going to go back and look at the book of Enoch again, and I opened it up, dog-eared chapter 72, the book of the courses of the heavenly luminaries, and I'm like, I just started laughing because I had just made that um, uh, the uh, video uh, of showing the the course of the sun and moon over the disk of the earth using Stellarium, which it took me days to figure out how to get it to do what I wanted it to do. But I was convinced that if I put my location in Antarctica uh, and played around with the camera settings in, in the various view modes, that I would be able to depict the sun and moon going overhead in its full cycle. Uh, and I picked Antarctica because I figured that would be... I, what I really wanted to do was see, you know, where it talks... People always say you know, they have times where the sun never goes down and times where it's always dark, you know, so I wanted to see it in the software, but an unexpected side effect of that little test was it perfectly illustrated how the sun and moon go over the earth. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and tonight my guest is Zen Garcia. We're talking about the Flat Earth Controversy, and we're going to be getting into his new book, the Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. And right before the break, uh, we were talking about how we both had decided to go back and revisit that book. And uh, wow, I mean, as you do, and if you put aside the preconceived notions of the spinning heliocentric globe model in an ever-expanding universe, the Book of Enoch really comes alive. And what really got me, Zen, is when I got to chapter 89, and that's where you're in the prophetic dream of Enoch, where he, he has sort of this uh, animal farm style dream, uh, and he basically goes from like creation right to the right to the end of everything, um, right through the millennial reign and, and all of it. And in that chapter, as he's describing the 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 way the flood happened, it, he's talking about uh, that he looked up and he saw. The, the, a lofty roof. In verse 2, he says, And again I raised mine eyes toward heaven and saw a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon, and those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. 
And again, and be, I saw again, and behold, fountains were opened on the surface of that great enclosure, and that water began to swell and rise upon the surface. And I saw that enclosure till its surface was covered with water. And he goes on to describe an enclosure that has a roof that has openings through which the windows of heaven were opened and water came through and filled up the bathtub, basically causing the flood. And, uh, I mean, when I got to... Again, I opened the page and had dog-eared at chapter 71. I opened 72. It starts to make a lot more sense, the sun and moon going over the earth. I seem to confirm it with Stellarium. And then I read chapter 89, and I'm like, man, Enoch is a slam dunk for the flat earthers. Oh, yeah, I, I fully agree. And, um, and, and, and also in studying you know, Isaiah chapter 40, because uh, I know you've done this as well with the Strong's Concordance, looking at the difference between uh, the description of the earth as a circle and trying to find a word uh, which would apply to the earth as a planet or a globe or anything like that. And the closest that you can come is the word ball, which Isaiah uses um, 18 chapters prior. It, it lets you know. And then the description of um, the earth as the foundation and the heavens being spread, the firmament being spread as a curtain above it, it fully ties in with what you were just saying. I mean, the circle of the earth is the floor and the the canopy or the globe, the dome-like, um, you know, the covering, the curtain spread above it, it fits exactly with what you're talking about. And and the description of the world together, the the foundation of the earth and the heavens, the firmament spread above it uh, as a tabernacle or a tent, that makes sense with the order of creation in Genesis. Because if you think about it, um, and the prior, if if you try to apply the order of creation to the earth spinning in orbit around the sun. Why would the the Most High make the Earth first and then create the star that the Earth is supposedly in orbit around um, next and placing it in the firmament? That, that doesn't make sense. But when you understand that the Earth is the foundation for the heavenly luminaries and that the firmament is spread above it, then that completely makes sense. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the Isaiah 40.22 thing... You know, I have to admit, for as recently as this past December, I was teaching the spinning heliocentric globe model idea, the canopy theory, as it was called, with the uh, the Earth was, as a ball had a canopy of ice around it, and that was the firmament. But again, when I go back to the scriptures without preconceived notions, I saw things that I never, I had read it. I can't tell you how many times I've read it and and quoted it and used it in presentations. But in Genesis one, it tells you. That it put the that, that that God put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament on, on day four, and not outside it and around it, and and it, it's like it just left off the page. I'm like, I, I, how many times have I read this and didn't see it? And yet I taught a paradigm that forced a view of that text to say that the sun, moon, and stars were outside of the firmament, and that the firmament was this ice canopy thing, and that's what Kent Hovind teaches, that's what Carl Baugh teaches, that's what a lot of creationists teach, that's what I taught. But that's not what the scriptures say. And when I've talked to people about this, especially Christians who, who don't want to go down this path, they'll all throw out Isaiah forty twenty two. But what struck me is if you go back one verse prior to verse 21, Isaiah forty twenty one says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are his grasshoppers, that stretch out the heavens as a curtain and stretch and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. In other words, he starts that whole that famous verse that everybody uses by by encouraging the reader to go back to Genesis. He's asking right. Haven't you read it? Yeah, haven't you seen it? Haven't you been taught about it? And I'm going, wow, and you're right. Isaiah, of all the guys in the Bible, he's the only guy, at least in the King James, who uses the word for ball, but he doesn't use it to describe the earth. He uses right. it in 22.18. And, and the other thing about 40.22 that's problematic is it says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain and as a tent. 
you, now, what ancient tent, because you've got to put yourself in the context, we talked context earlier, of Isaiah, what ancient, you know, Bedouin-style tent goes all the way around you under your feet and everywhere? Exactly. <laughs> a tent is set up on a flat earth surface, stretched out over it. And he's using that metaphor to describe the snow globe. Right. Exactly. And, you know, there were three other things, um, because when I finally embraced the the flat earth and started really studying the Bible, and and I covered this in in the new book that I just released, but uh, there were three other things. One in Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar describes the seeing a tree growing up from the midst of the earth and reaching to the heavens and he says that the tree is um that it's able to be seen from er, from every end of the earth uh and then the other one is um when Yeshua is taken up by Satan and showed all the kingdoms of the world um taken to an exceedingly high mountain and he's offered all of these kingdoms if he would just bow in worship before him. And then the other one um, where he returns for his second coming and like lightning is seen every eye, it says in Revelation and in Matthew 24, that every eye shall see him. Well, all of that didn't, I really didn't even think about it. But when you try to apply that to the earth as a globe, it, it doesn't make sense because a tree or even a mountain, how would you see all of the kingdoms of the world? Because um, at, at some portion of the earth would be on the other side if we were living on a globe. Uh, and even with his returning, even in the clouds with all of the saints, some portion of the earth, the people on some portion of the earth, just would not see him. But if you apply those three things to the flat earth and to to the current, those events and their occurrence in, with that kind of a premise, then they absolutely fit and make sense and also align with what Isaiah refers to in chapter 40 and also with what Enoch describes and talks about um, in the courses on the heavenly luminaries. Yeah, and, and like I said earlier, from Genesis to Revelation, man, the whole thing is is flat Earth because, like Absolutely. I said, when, you know, when you start off in Genesis, like Isaiah said, haven't you heard? Haven't you seen? Uh, right. And then you get to Revelation, and you're right. I mean, so much of Revelation now really comes alive for me as I'm looking at this stuff. I mean, and the other thing that that struck me about looking at the Bible from a flat earth perspective, is all the prophecies. I mean, Isaiah talked about it. Uh, Jesus talked about it. Peter talks about it. John talks about it. That The stars are going to fall to earth. It's, all the stars of heaven are going to fall to earth like figs. Well, in, in our normal cosmological worldview that we're taught in school, that's very problematic and, in fact, impossible. Right. But if, if we're in a snow globe, then the stars are not what monkey man science is trying to tell us they are. They have to be something different. Now, I know what I believe the stars are. Uh, what's your take on the stars and the snow globe? What, what's, what do you believe they are, and how far away do you think they are? Well, I know, um, but just by looking at the sun, when you watch it going down in the clouds at sunset, or like if you watch a, a video of um, a weather balloon being sent up, to, you know how they're doing that lately, to trying to determine... Yeah. Uh, the horizon, what the horizon looks like. Well, you see the uh, hot spot um, when it gets really high up. You'll see the hot spot of the sun reflected off of the cloud bank. Yeah. And that, to me, designates that the sun is a lot closer. Definitely not 92,960,000 miles away. And also with the way that it descends through the clouds with you know the the varying degrees, the angles uh, of the sun's rays. They spread out in a a fan like kind of spectrum um, at all different angles. And and if the sun was ninety three million miles away and uh, of such immensity that one hundred and nine Earths could be spread across the breadth of its um, its diameter, then all of the sun's rays would hit the Earth parallel to one another and there would be no 
deviation to the angle of it, it's you know being cascade on on the earth and so that to me means that um it's a lot closer than what we are told and I, and I also cover in my book how Enoch describes the sun moving through the six gates of heaven which are spread from the tropic of capricorn to the tropic of cancer and that it takes six months for it to travel in slow daily ro revolution uh, up and down between the tropic of cancer and the tropic of capricorn this to me also designates that the sun has to be much smart uh, smaller than the breadth of that distance and if you if you look up uh, um, the degree as far as latitude, it equals like 69 miles for every one degree. And when you uh, multiply that by the 23 degrees north latitude and 23 degrees south latitude, you get a distance of 3,174 miles. And so the sun has to be smaller than that 3,174 mile distance. And uh, another thing as far as... Um, and since we're talking about sunsets, as far as curvature, when you're out on the beach and you're watching sunset and you see the sun going down, you, and m most people will be able to relate to this experience, you see a line um, refracted off of the ocean, or if it's a big lake, you'll see a line between the sun and the observer going all the way out to until the sun reaches the vanishing point and when it disappears then that line disappears but before then you will see a line going all the way out from the feet of the observer all the way out to the point where the sun seems to set on the horizon that to me signifies that between the observer and the sun the earth is completely flat that there's no curvature because if there were you would never be able to see the the sun reaching all the way to you and and in that you know reflecting in that um, as a as a line between you and the and the sun um, if there were curvature that line would be broken somewhere between you and the sun yeah this is uh, there's a number of uh, websites popping up uh, or not so much websites but um, blogs and whatnot popping up on websites where various uh, Christian authors, apologetics types are out there trying to debunk all this stuff that we're talking about. And inevitably, they always seem to point to Eratosthenes and his grand experiment of, the, of seeing the shadow, uh, Syene and Alexandria, a, a longer shadow of the obelisks and whatnot. And his, his conclusion, because the shadow was like straight down where he was and he knew, I forget how far away, 80 or 200 miles or something, whatever it was, uh, the, the, the obelisk shadow was longer. Uh, his conclusion was the earth has to be a ball. And so he comes up with a mathematical uh, equation that if you keep drawing the line of the two obelisks till they meet on a ball – then you can come up with a mathematical equation that will explain how big the ball is. So he comes up with 25,000 miles in circumference. Based on pure speculation, there's no way he could have proved it. All he proved is if you got two sticks on a ball, you, you can come up with the math to figure out how big the ball is. I, mean, the, I applaud him for that. Good job. You got some good math going on there. Way cool. <laughs> but you didn't prove that the Earth is anything. Right. Uh, and and what I'm, I'm screaming at these guys who they think they're so smart. Oh, we got you now, flat earther. We've got the Eratosthenes. You know, you guys are idiots. This was figured out 200 BC. But what they're what they're not considering is that the flat earthers this isn't catching them by surprise. As you pointed out, the the sun has to be way smaller and a whole lot closer uh than what we're told told in monkey man science and that it is the sun and the moon that are moving, not the earth. So over 60 verses in the Bible describe the sun, moon, and stars moving. Zero for the earth moving. And if you've got a small sun over the area where Eratosthenes was, then sure, that the sun's above the obelisk. It's going to have a shadow straight down. And it will also cast a long shadow uh, for that other one that's further away. 
on a flat plane. So Eratosthenes right. didn't prove anything. And I'm like, what are you guys – why are you, these – all these websites and blogs and everything popping up, they, like, oh, he's the guy. He figured it out. I'm like, he didn't prove anything except, you know, you can create cool math to figure out if you put sticks on a ball. But that doesn't prove that the earth is a ball. And so once you realize, okay, the sun and moon are a lot closer and a lot smaller – then what are the galaxies and the nebula and the stars? Right, which I didn't get it. I forgot to answer your question. Um, they signify to me that, you know, they're not definitely not stars and the, how NASA speaks of the cosmology as that all these stars are millions and billions of miles away and that they all um, have... Uh, their own planetary systems and uh, all of that to me is you know that they're they're just lights in the heaven it's like um i was also talking about in my book uh how the days of the week they receive their names from the mm -hmm. the cosmology like sunday from the sun monday from the moon um tuesday and all these different days are from these different gods but they all um are, are also represented by the different planets um and how the earth is not represented in that cosmology because it's my opinion that the ancients knew that the earth was different than the other planetary bodies um that's why they didn't you know uh, assign the earth with the same designation like as chronos you know for Saturn's day, Saturday, or uh, the sun and the moon, and uh, or Aries for Mars. Um, these different planets, they knew that they were different than than the Earth, which again falls back on the order of creation. And so, as far as what the stars are up there in the heavens, they're certainly not these massive gas gaseous bodies that uh, science is claiming that they are. Uh, they're luminaries. They're um, lights, and the the different stars that comprise the zodiac. Um, they are also the zodiac is to uh, for measurement of time. Same thing as for the sun and the moon, and how the day is based on the the movement of the sun once around the uh, north pole as it cycles and revolution above the earth and how um a week is a, you know like a, a equivalent of a quarterly phase of, of the moon in its cycle and the month is a, equivalent to four of its quarterly phases and then these 12 lunar months which is a whole other thing um uh, in studying about the book of enoch and all of the um the the flat earth as being the the thing, the key to decrypt the Book of Enoch, I was also led to study and understand uh, God's calendar and how that works, the ancient Hebrew calendar, and um, how we are deceived now, modern mainstream Christians, as well as um, the Jews and Seventh-day Adventists, none of them are actually worshiping on Sabbath, because Sabbath isn't aligned to any of these seven days of the uh, the week Sabbath is uh, determined first by what's called the Kadesh, the time of the new moon, and that has its own day. Um, Kadesh as new moon day is counted as the first day and first Sabbath of the lunar month, but it's not included in the seventh day count of the next following four Sabbath weeks, which also align with the quarterly phases of the moon. Um, and I learned how that also falls with falls in line with the study of the seven Levitical feast days of um, chapter 23 in Leviticus and how um, Yeshua fulfilled in his first coming the first three spring and the summer feast and how he will fulfill the three fall feasts. And all of these things are critical for understanding um, how we've been deceived and, and how modern Christians no longer keep track of Sabbath, as well as how we've been deceived into 
um, honoring festivals, which are uh, basically uh, an amalgamation of the of the pagan and Christian holidays uh, back during the time of Constantine, and how most people no longer honor the seven Levitical um, feasts and festivals as laid out in Leviticus chapter 23. And so all of those things are have been critical for, um, you know, my study of the flat earth. Uh, it's led, led me to understand all of these other revelations in connection to, um, to the flat earth. And so it's been an amazing journey for me. That's really interesting. Um, I, yeah, I came at it from a different perspective. Back in 2009 is when I started getting more of an appreciation and understanding of the Torah and God's holidays, his appointed times, his Moedim, and how they all worked. And, I, you know, there's a lot of people, and we, we could spend a whole show debating the, the merits, pros, and cons, and whatnot of the ideas of lunar Sabbath or weekly Sabbath or when does the year begin or is it conjunction moon or is it crescent moon? And there's still lots of disagreement on that. But what I'm what I find intriguing about the whole thing is, is like there's this convergence of, of these themes and ideas that were off everybody's radar five years ago. I mean, who was thinking about any of this stuff? And right, yeah, you, know, you know, Mark Biltz uh, was the one that sort of put the blood moon tetrad thing on the map for everybody to start considering, and the fact that they were. Uh, lining up on the Lord's feast days, although I will say this, they only line up on the feast days if you go by the conjunction. Again, this is one of those situations where people differ. Uh, if the year and the month starts with a conjunction, then yeah, the the tetrads are landing on the feast days. If, however, you believe that the years and, and months begin with a uh, the first sliver of the new moon, then they don't line up. But I just find it interesting that all of these subjects seem to be converging. Like, you know, you came at it, I'm looking at a flat earth, and all of a sudden, wow, look at the Moedim, the, the appointed times of God. This is interesting. Look at the Sabbath and all this. I came at it here. Wow, look at the Sabbath. Look at the feast. This is cool. I'm going to get rid of Christmas and Easter. Oh, wow, look at flat earth. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just questioning, going, okay, Lord, what are you doing? Like, wh why? I mean, I understand getting out of Babylon and getting rid of the, the what I can now call the beast feasts, uh, Christmas and Easter and all that stuff, and getting on God's page. Right. With his Moedim, I, I get that, but I'm, I'm like, okay, Lord, why is it that, you know, for the most part, for 500 years, most people have believed in the, uh, in the, uh, in the spinning heliocentric globe? Um, but now, here we are in the 21st century of all time, you know, of all things, having this discussion. And what intrigued me was that Flatter seems to be intimately connected with this whole idea of climate change. Uh, or climate chaos, according to the French foreign min minister. And if you question anything to do with climate change, you must be a flat earther, i.e. you must be a stupid, stupid, ignorant moron. So I'm just – as I look at things, and I know I've heard you say it too, you're, we're all having to reconsider all of our old material because, <laughs> you know, how does the Anunnaki play into this? How does Planet X play into this? How does all this other stuff, you know, the, the secret NASA program with the alien bases on the other side of the moon and, you know, all this other – rabbit trails that we've been intrigued with, we now kind of have to reevaluate with this new understanding, assuming this is true. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I've been praying like crazy, like, Lord, wh why is it, why is this convergence of ideas happening at this juncture, at this day and time? Yeah, that's, um, the, uh, I've been going through the whole same thing in my mind, and all the questions that you just brought up, uh, the quandaries, uh, the conundrums in connection to, you know, NASA and the secret Apollo missions and uh, the Anunnaki, Planet X, all of that. Yeah, I th I'm having to reconsider all of it, and I'm still undecided on on a lot of it. You know, I'm still because, like you, I've only been on. You know, the study of the flat earth for I think since maybe July and Hold that thought. Well, we'll pick it up yeah. yep. hello and welcome back to the revolutionary radio project I am your host Rob Skiba we're going into the second hour of this broadcast I'm talking with my guest Zen Garcia about his new book 
and uh, we're discussing the uh, topic of the flat earth. And right before the break, we were saying how you know both of us have traveled down similar paths of research, looking into things like the secret space program and you know alleged moon bases on the other side and uh, Apollo 18 and uh, some of the other missions that we weren't told about, supposedly finding aliens out there. And how does all this new revelation fit in with things like uh, the Great Pyramid and uh, Planet X, Nibiru, the Anunnaki, all that stuff. I, I, don't, I really don't, I don't know. I've never, I just did a whole teaching back in December on the Great Pyramid. And in that teaching, I was showing how various measurements of the Great Pyramid seem to clearly illustrate a globe. However, I, I don't, I certainly never have, and I don't know that anybody else ever has, applied the same measurements to the idea of the circle of the earth and i would venture to guess we would probably be amazed if we did because the great pyramid was built at a time when the ancient near east the entire world at that time believed in the snow globe so you know maybe it's time to revisit all of this stuff with sort of new eyes for at least for the sake of of taking an honest look uh, at the information, um, you know, condemnation before investigation is the height of ignorance. So, where's the harm in looking into it? Uh, that's sort of my position on it right now. But I'm, I'm actually quite intrigued to go back to a lot of my old research and see. Okay, I did all this with the preconceived idea of a spinning heliocentric globe. What would happen if I looked at it from a stationary? And, and by the way, I, I am. While I'm still questioning the globe, I'm not questioning heliocentricity and geocentricity anymore. I'm, I'm going to say I'm about at least 99% sure that this, this place is not moving. Geocentricity, I am sold on geocentricity. But if, if geocentricity is true, then just about everything else starts to fall apart because everything that we're taught in the standard model is based on heliocentricity. So if that crumbles, then I, I think we got to go back to the drawing board on everything. What do you think? Uh, I absolutely agree, and I and I think it's um, that we should reassess and relook at a lot of the stuff that you know we were assimilated into believing um, when we were children, and so much of what we take for granted, and giving NASA the benefit of the doubt when you know they are purposely deceiving us and and they've been busted so many times doing so i mean the just in the number of programs that you've done in covering um how they have lied to us and uh, you know basically photoshopping uh the earth you know putting it into pictures of um these supposed apollo missions to the moon and and, and how so many you know there's even a picture of um, the lunar module landing for the first time on the moon. I mean, how is that possible if that's the first the time? They set the camera crew up first. <laughs> say that again? They set the camera crew up first. Right, exactly. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing how, how grand the deception is. And so I think it's wise for us to reassess and look again at uh, a lot of the things that we just have accepted. Um, without you know giving it any consideration, and it's the same thing with uh, the Book of Enoch. Because looking at it with new eyes and uh, applying the flat Earth model to it, it helped me to understand the whole text on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. Whereas before, uh, I was unable to make any sense um, of it at all, but. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. A passage in um, Enoch 71.8, and this is like one of the key passages that didn't make sense to me prior, but in looking at it um, as if Enoch is looking face down on what is the azimuthal equidistant projection map, the sun sets in heaven and returning by the north, to proceed towards the east is conducted so as to enter by that gate and illuminate the face of heaven. So here Enoch is describing the sun taking a circular uh, trajectory and rotating in revolution above the earth. But when you try to apply that passage to 
the the globe it's like huh yeah. you know it just it does not make any kind of sense but when um when i applied it again to the flat earth and looking as if i was looking down uh, almost like if the earth was a clock's face and the motion of the sun and the moon above it um just like you know the map that they show on in the un flag which that's a whole another topic <laughs> i know uh, you know, because it's my opinion that they're flaunting the that they know what the real um, the the real Earth looks like, um, but it almost like a a Masonic handshake, yeah, like a secret gang sign to their affiliated members. But anyways, when you apply it this this particular scripture to that model of the Earth, then it clicks. And then when you look at the rest of the passages. Um, from seventy one chapter seventy one through eighty two I believe which in in this book i I cover every one of the scriptures in all twelve of these chapters, and I show people what Enoch is talking about. I explain it um, there 's photo you know illustrations so that people can understand uh, what he 's referring to. Um, and and help people to understand the even the six gates because he's talking about you know the the distance between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and how it moves back and forth and how every month um, the there's a 30 day window that it moves from one gate to the other and then that there are four days where it takes the sun one day to either cross over the equator. Or having reached um, the Tropic of Cancer or Tropic of Capricorn to reverse course and return in the opposite direction. Just like what you showed with how you were able to get the, the Stellarium to, as it applies to, you know, circling above the face of the, the Earth. And so all of those things, uh, it, it's a fascinating discovery. And that's why I stopped. Uh, the work that I was doing in, in that book on the war in heaven and began working on this book um, because I felt like with so much interest now, so many people being led to um, look at this particular study that nobody had um, had relayed what Enoch was talking about in describing the motions of the sun. I, there's a lot of people that allude to his description of the motions of the moon but I, I couldn't find any books or any particular web pages that talked about his description of the motions of the of the sun and that the reason being is because we're all trying to process his vision according to the heliocentric model which you can't make sense of it when you're trying to apply it in that way yeah when you were looking into the issues of the various gates, because that's something that kind of tripped me up. I was thinking, okay, what's it? What's he talking about? I mean, are there? I mean, it uses words like portals and gates and stuff. And so it sounds like when we hear that, that there's a physical structure that the sun is going through. But I don't. I don't think so. I think that unless it's a metaphysical thing that we can't see. Um, but I'm wondering if it if if these gates and portals are maybe not uh, a way of look, if you're looking down from from God's point of view, if if the gates and portals are not something that's in the the luminaries, in other words, the the constellations we would call the constellations, you know, the suns in Virgo or the suns in this or whatever, uh, you know, the the various houses of the zodiac. Uh, people refer to the sun being in those houses, so they use similar terminology even t- even today. Uh, even in science, I mean, NASA will, will make references to things like that. So, what's your take on? I mean, is that what you're what you're thinking, or do you have another view of the gates? Well, I, portals I, I explain point? this um, exactly because what Enoch is describing as the six gates is if you you know the equator exactly um, splits the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Right. Well, Enoch describes the sun's movement through these six gates, and he begins with the sun aligned exactly on the equator of the vernal, 
uh, on the day of the vernal equinox. That's where he begins his account of the sun's motion. And then he talks about it taking 30 days to go through the fourth gate. Well, if you look at the, the distance between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, the first three gates are from the Tropic of Capricorn, the first gate, second gate, and third gate reaches the equator. And then the fourth, fifth, and sixth gate are above the equator. And so he will talk about how it takes the sun 30 days to go through each one of these gates. And just as you saw when you applied the, the movement of the sun according to the Stellarium, yeah. the sun moves 30 days through the fourth gate, 30 days through the fifth gate, and then 31 days it will reach the Tropic of Cancer for the summer solstice. And it spends that one extra day reaching culmination at the summer solstice and then reversing course will begin to descend back through the sixth gate, the fifth gate, and the fourth gate until reaching the equator on the autumnal equinox. And then it descends through the third gate, the second gate, and the first gate. And on um, reaching the first gate, that will be winter solstice. And then it reverses course and goes back up through the first, second, and third gate until reaching the equator again, but, and so but that the gates. What, what are they? I mean, is it just a? Is it just a? It's just a distance. It it just it's the each one of the gates um, is the equivalent of thirty days. Uh, what takes the sun thirty revolutions? Mm-hmm. It takes the sun thirty revolutions, thirty days. Um, you know, rotations to go through one of the gates. It's not that it's you know, a portal that it goes through it on this side and it comes out on the other side. Right. It's just a, a measure of distance that divides the, you know, the distance between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And so when you understand it this way, as I explained in my book, he talks about even he breaks down the equivalent of the proportion between day and night for each one of these gates. And the equivalent is 18 units. And so when the, um, when the sun is directly on the equator, it divides day and night by nine units, which equals to like 11.9999 hours. Basically, all you have to do is um, divide 24 hours by 18, and you'll see that it, it uh, equates to 1.33333 hours. And so, um, and so, you know, the, the, it changes as the sun climbs through the gates or descends through the gates, it will increase its proportion by 1.3333 hours uh, as it goes through each one of the gates. And so um, the six gates just apply um, to its movement um, over, over the course of a year between you know, between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And so it, it when you understand it this way and you look at the gates, because, um, you know, as I said, there's illustrations that divide the gates and help people to understand it. And then when I explain it with the breakdown of day and night, um, and I also talk about how, because um, God's calendar, the way that it, it begins on the vernal equinox with spring, you know how the Gregorian calendar begins on January 1st in the middle of winter. Uh, that's not how it's, it's lined up. The, the progression of the seasons is spring, summer, fall, and then winter, uh, as is described by Enoch, which he begins on the vernal equinox. And the, on the vernal equinox, that's the first day of spring, and then it goes through the three months until reaching summer solstice, and summer solstice is the first day of summer, and then as it falls back towards the autumnal equinox, that's the first day of fall, and then as it arrives to the winter solstice, that's the first day of winter, and that's the progression of the year uh, according to God's calendar. And you cover that 
from looks like section two in your book, pretty much chapters fifteen yeah. through uh, twenty four. Right. The the section two is all on dis, how I um, decipher the the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. The first part is um, about you know setting the foundation for what I'm going to be talking about, and that I cover the um, Isaiah chapter forty, the entire chapter um, for the most part, because I I think it's important to look at you know, the the full context of the entire chapter instead of just the one passage as far as verse 22. Uh, and when you do that, you understand that the earth was established first, exactly as you were describing with the, the previous verse um, where it refers back to Genesis, how the earth was established as the f- a firm, fixed, and stationary um, foundation for the curtain of the heavens, the firmament that was spread above it. And there's several, you know, passages in the Bible which also allude to the earth being firm, like um, Chronicles chapter 16, where it says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Uh, Psalm 93, 1, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also established that it cannot be moved. I mean, there's so many passages where it talks about the earth being stationary, fixed, and unmoving, which is exactly why Joshua, um, you know, referred when he was giving commandment to the sun and the moon to stand still, why he didn't tell the earth and the moon to stand still, because the earth is unmoving and it's the sun and the moon which um rotate above it so do you think because i you know that story joshua commanding the sun to stand still i've told that story so many times in in my nephilim talks usually uh you know the various conquests of israel and and joshua and caleb and all that and Joshua commanding the sun to stand still i always said whenever i talked about it, i said now if my understanding of the cosmos is correct then the Earth stopped rotating for the sun to stand still. Of course, if the Earth stops rotating, then you lose the, the you basically lose everything. I mean, the magnetic field goes away, you lose gravity, you have a thousand mile an hour wind shear. Now, this is according to globalist science. Uh, Neil deGrasse right. Tyson describes this in great detail. In, in an interview he was with uh, Larry King, Larry King asked him, you know, what would happen if the Earth stopped rotating? He's like, oh, that'd be a bad day, and here's why, you know. So all the terrible things, according to Monkey Man science, this is what would happen if the Earth stopped spinning. So, and of course, the, the kindergarten answer is, well, God just suspended all of the laws of the, everything, you know, to, to make uh, Joshua's request work. And okay, but that's never going to satisfy uh, an intellectual mind, you know, saying that. But it makes a whole lot more sense if it is the sun and moon moving, because that doesn't really affect the Earth. Right. Not like in the spinning heliocentric globe model. Uh, and, and I keep going back to this thing. If, if geocentricity is true and, and the Earth is not moving, and, and uh, the Michelson-Morley, I think, it, I think that's what it's called. There's several tests. I forget the name. Right, it's right. About the Aries failure. All these different tests mm-hmm. that were done that proved this place isn't moving. Now, all the tests that I've seen... And commentaries on it are done by people who believe in the globe, but they're saying the globe is not moving. This place is stationary. Right. So, you know, regardless, whatever the shape of the earth is, we're not moving. So if you if you realize that the earth is not moving, then so much of what we're taught in school and in documentaries and TV shows and movies is false. It's just, even if it is a globe, it, it's so much of that stuff is false, but... I, it seems to me that once you settle on geocentricity and you start to see how the heliocentric model falls apart, as does most of the models that we are told about, then it's not much of a slide from that point over into flat Earth. Uh, it seems like a fairly easy slide. Now, there's pl- the, why haven't I slid over yet? Well, I, I, I will acknowledge straight up the Bible and the Book of Enoch are absolutely flat Earth books, as is the writing uh, as are the writings of many ancient cultures, it's flat earth. But my Bible also tells me in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to prove all things. So 
that's what I'm trying to do. I can believe it. Yeah, I believe the Bible's true. I believe the Bible says it's a flat earth. That is true. I believe that. That's what it says. Can I prove it? Well, that's, that's what testing the globe is all about. I'm trying to go out and prove it. it you seem to have read the text and took a, uh, a step of faith, went out on the air publicly and said, you know what? <laughs> it's flat earth. Um, what was it that absolutely convinced you? Was it just the text or was there a practical experiment or something that, uh, that you could observe for yourself to confirm the text? Well, the fact that you cannot, um, there's no, you can't measure any curvature. And in looking at um, lighthouses, um, even with the, the way that railroads, bridges, canals, um, the engineers that draw up the blueprints, they don't take into any kind of consideration at all the curvature of the earth. That's true. Um, the, when, when a pilot um, is, um, you know, as far as flying the people that are going to jump out of his airplane, he doesn't take into consideration which way he's flying or which way the earth is rotating. Um, and they don't consider, you know, which way the mark is going, the target is going to rotate with the earth. Uh, they jump above it and then they guide themselves down towards it. Um, there's no consideration for movement of the earth. And so these things together, and then understanding the book of Enoch in the way that I have, uh, the courses of the heavenly luminaries, that was the final piece for me and and then also you know you've seen the video that i've done on the where i found the bible code uh on Mm -hmm. which is related to the the flat earth and how explain that from explain that for my listeners okay sure there's um you can go to a website called biblecodewisdom.com and in that particular website you can search key terms um, keywords, and you can find, you know, whatever topic it is that you're trying to prove or confirm, or because I believe that the Bible codes are inspired. Um, how else could you know all of these terms be encoded into the text thousands of years ago? And it's only now, with the use of computers, that we can even locate these matrices. And so I go. I use BibleCodeWinston.com to um, kind of confirm the fringe topics that I am researching. And so, of course, the first two terms that I plugged into the search bar was flat Earth. And when I found that those two terms, I then started to plug in other keywords as it applied to the circle of the Earth in the vision of Isaiah in chapter 40. And so eventually I developed a matrix and the matrix that I was able to fl- uh, find, and people can pull this up for themselves, just go to biblecodewisdom.com, type in flat earth, canopy, tent, truth, ring, edge, even, and dome. And you'll find all of these words compiled in one matrix and as keywords they apply to what we're talking about uh, as far as the the foundation of the earth and the firmament above it and being in the shape of a tent or a tabernacle um even you know the keyword canopy the keyword tent a uh, truth uh the ring you know as far as the antarctic ice wall as being the edge um of this circle of the earth, um, the flat earth being even, um, and and again, the dome uh, above it, you know, as far as the firmament. And so all of these words plugged in, I was able to discover this matrix, and when you pull up this matrix, you see how the words are all spread out in equal letter sequence. It's not like they were just you know, words straight across as a lot of, um, when people search for matrix, a lot of times those words will be found within the text and they'll be straight across. But in this matrix, every one of those words was 
spread out in this equal letter sequencing, uh, which to me was verification that um, it you know had to have been inspired for it to be encoded in the way that you can discover in the matrix. And so that to me confirmed again, um, as did the Book of Enoch, that this was truth, based on truth, and that it was biblical. And you cover that in chapter 10, it looks like, right? Yeah. Chapter 10 of your book. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people, uh, I haven't done a whole lot of research into the Bible codes. I mean, I'm aware of them. I know what, they're, what they are and what they're about. Um, and, I, and a lot of people are really sold on it. I know um, Elie Marzulli did a, a whole thing on it, I think, in his Watchers DVD series. So you actually went out and tried to test that. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for this final half-hour segment. I'm talking with my guest, Zen Garcia, about his new book called The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. And right before the break, we were discussing uh, Chapter 10 of the book, where Zen was telling us that he had looked up um, various keywords related to Flat Earth and all that uh, in the Bible Codes at BibleCodeWisdom.com. Yeah, it's you know that's something that, like I said, I haven't I haven't really studied that much. I mean, I, I'm aware of it. I know how it works, but uh, it's not something I've really dabbled with. But it is interesting. You said you uh, plugged this stuff in there, and it seemed to confirm it, huh? Right. Um, people can do it for themselves, and and I that wasn't the only matrix. I um, because you're only allowed to enter so many characters into the search bar. Um, I had discovered so many terms that I began a second matrix, and the second one is a flat earth, fixed disk, ring with ends. Um, And so, you know, this was a a second confirming matrix on the flat earth, so it was indeed encoded within the text. Uh, And as I said, people can go there, type the keywords that I gave, um, related to these t- matrices and pull them up for yourself and look at them and you know it also when you do that it tells you what portion of the text it, the matrix is found overlaying um and so it's a it's an interesting way to in my opinion to confirm um whether you know some kind of fringe topic like what we're talking about as far as the flat earth whether it is indeed found uh, encoded within the text in this manner. Well, I mean, just a plain reading of the text. You know, it's not even encoded. It's like here it is, Earth's flat, set on pillars, right under a dome. <laughs> but if you really need confirmation, go check out the codes. You know, I mean, it's it's right there. But I appreciate something you said though. Go do it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got people on Facebook messaging me. You know, this guy's wrong about this. He's wrong about that. Whatever. You know, he shouldn't be teaching if you know you can't get this right or whatever. My whole thing is like, look guys, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. Zen Garcia is not your teacher. I'm not your teacher. Your favorite pastor is not your teacher. Your favorite scholar is not your teacher. All of us are out there doing the best we can with the information that we have, trying to figure stuff out. But we are told to prove all things by the Scriptures and to test all the spirits you know, by the Word of God and to pray and let the Holy Spirit be your guide. It's the Holy Spirit that leads you to all truth. In the meantime, you know, my, my feeling is, because I have plenty of guests on here, uh, and we don't all agree on everything, but if we agree that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, then you're my brother, you're my sister. If we can agree on, we can agree on that, awesome. The rest of it, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. But, you know, anybody listening to this broadcast, look, don't look at me as your source for truth. Don't look at Zen or any of the other people who have been on this show or any other show. You know, listen to the information and go look it up for yourself. Test it for yourself. I think you would agree with that. Absolutely. And I I think that uh, Proverbs 18, you know, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a falling, a shame unto him. And just as you said, we are to look and to prove and to test it for ourselves. Don't, um, Don't believe anybody else on as far as being an authority on the scriptures, but go and look um, and and see if that's what it says uh, according to your own research and your own study. Um, because in what I have discovered in my experience is that 
the the scriptures read meaningless until people have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand. And that until you do, we just don't understand the revelations and and the things that have been there all along. Uh, you know, just like what we were talking about with uh, Joshua. You know, as far as um, the sun and the moon standing still. When you look at that passage, also there were no repercussions to the earth when the moon and the sun were stopped in mid revolution above the earth there were no repercussions there were no giant tsunamis no massive tornadoes no you know earthquakes and um anything that was noticeable that was mentioned within the text um which also shows that because as you said if the earth were spinning around the sun and all of a sudden it were to just stop in mid motion uh, there'd be massive tidal waves tsunamis you know the whole portions of the earth inundated the uh, the polar cap may have slipped or shifted in some way who knows i mean there would have been huge repercussions to in my opinion to something like that occurring but um, with the sun and the moon being of much smaller proportion than the earth and the earth being the foundation for the heavenly luminaries um, this is, is further confirmation that the sun and the moon move above the earth which another thing as far as science they because they're trying to say that the earth you know the whole heliocentric model and that the earth is spinning in orbit around the sun they also say that the the moon spins in similar counterclockwise fashion when enoch references that both the sun and moon spin clockwise above the earth um, but because they're trying to hold on to this heliocentric model they say that the the moon is in synchronous rotation with the earth and that's why it appears that it is unmoving as it goes through its quarterly phases. Um, you know, and so that they explain, and when you look and observe, even like with um, the lunar conjunction, the moon moves with the sun, meaning that it rises when it rises, it moves across the sky as it moves across the sky, and it sets as it sets. If it were moving in the opposite direction, then it, you know, it would only be um, un, 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 invisible and un, being unable to be seen for a very short time as it passed um, over the sun or the sun blocked it out. But once they spread apart in their, uh, their circuits, then the moon would be visible and uh, it would never hold the similar a cycle of going through its phases as we are able to see and observe with our own eyes. So, in the last uh, 20 minutes we have left, um, what is your take on all of this? Do you think that this is, let, let's say, it, it it is absolutely proven that the Earth is still circular, flat, set on pillars, under a dome. If that's the case, it seems to me that this is the great deception. If this is not the great deception, I, I, I shudder to think of what could be, because this is so huge. Right. Do, I mean, do you think... I, I'm coming to the... I'll just, t- I'll just tell you what I think. I'm, I am coming to the conclusion that as the more I look into this, and people are like, well, what about the Clark Belt? What about this? What about that? I mean, look, there's a lot of questions I don't have the answers to. Um, satellites. Are they real or are they not real? Uh, you know, I have no problem believing they could be real. I don't even have a problem believing the ISS could be real. Um, if the sun and moon are hovering up above us somehow, suspended up there in the canopy, um, I have no problem believing that other things could do the same thing. However, we're told that the satellites are in the thermosphere, and they call it the thermosphere for a reason because it's right. freaking hot up there. And we were told on 9-11, we started the show talking about 9-11, that uh, three buildings – basically melted or weakened the steel weakened uh at, you know temperatures of jet fuel and in an hour collapse into a pile of ash in their own footprint so if three skyscraper buildings can like basically melt with 
uh, what, 1,800 degrees of jet fuel? you got to explain to me how aluminum satellites are hanging up there in 5,000 degree temperatures for years and decades in some cases. I, I, I can't figure that one out. Um, but, yeah, there are a lot of questions I don't have the answers to. Uh, I have a lot of the yeah buts, too. But the more I look into this, and, and everybody wants to write off the Chicago skyline and a lot of these other things as a, it's a mirage, it's an optical illusion. I'm sorry, I'm not that stupid. I don't buy it. And, and, I, and if I was up there, I would rent a boat and I would drive across on a clear day. I would point my camera at the skyline that I could see from one end 60 miles away, and I would drive right to it and keep the camera on the city. So if you're out there, if you live on the other side of, of Lake Michigan, the other side of Chicago, if you're listening to the broadcast, please do this test. Go out there and do it, because if it's a mirage, then when you're driving out towards it, it'll magically disappear, and then you'll see the city roll up over the ball into view. But if it's not a mirage, if it's really the city that you're seeing 60 miles away, then as you're taking your little boat across, it's just going to get bigger. And I have a feeling that's what's going to happen, because every test that I have either done myself or have seen others do testing the horizon, they're seeing stuff that mathematically... It's impossible. You should not be able to see. So I, for me, this is not a cut and dry case for the globe or flat earth. There are a lot of variables, or a lot of what ifs. There are a lot of things that you know, many of us don't understand. But I think this discussion is healthy. And, I, and to get back to the question, in your view, could this be that great deception that we were warned is coming? Um, I absolutely believe that it is part of that strong delusion that, and I think you, I heard you say it. Um, yeah, that even the very elect, because the very elect are absolutely deceived on this issue. Um, and still, even though um, I believe the Book of Enoch and the Bible codes confirm that we live on a flat Earth and that it's a flat circular plane, and that the Earth does not move. There's still, I'm only, you know, since July into this and having written this book, there's still a lot of questions and a lot of things that I'm trying to discover and get answer upon. Um, Same thing with the satellites. My whole conclusion on that is the, you know, the thermosphere and the temperatures that they say that are... um, are up there as far as being up there in the thermosphere, satellites could not survive being suspended in that in those kind of temperatures, and so that makes me uh, wonder as to whether you know satellites are even real or not. Who, um, because according to those temperatures, the way that they are made, they would not be able to survive not for not for long at all, um, being a very pliable material and made of gold, you know, because gold is used to reflect, uh, refract the, the sun's rays and the radiation and uh, protect instruments and solar panels, you know, how sensitive those are. Um, but as far as the, the International Space Station, have you ever looked at the way that it's built? Um, because if you look at the, the diagram for the way that it's built, you would think that each portion of it would be compartmentalized so that if there was ever a breach, you could shut off, like, for instance, a submarine. Um, They have airlocks, you know. If um, one compartment floods, they're able to close these, uh, these locks and secure the rest of the boat from being flooded by that breach compartment. But the International Space Station is built in such a way that there are no barriers in the interior so that if a breach happens, everybody is going to end up dead. Everybody will die. And so that, to me, is, um, makes me suspicious as to whether it is in the vacuum of space because you would think that the safety of the astronauts would be first and foremost, and that they would build into the infrastructure um, protections from even simple things like this, you know, and um, and the fact that they don't exist and those in, those safety measures not, are not implemented and built into the infrastructure makes me suspicious as to you know where 
And then the whole thing as far as um, air bubbles, you know, where yeah. they're filming some of these uh, air wa- uh, spacewalks and then you see air bubbles or they've actually have, um, they've shown scuba divers, you know, with scuba tanks on in portions of some of these spacewalks. And, and, and then there was another um, a video that I have posted on my Fallen Angels TV website where it, they were showing a spacewalk from the International Space Station and the Earth um, scrolling by underneath it. And then all of a sudden it goes to a green screen. And uh, you've seen that too? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the problem, man. I mean, this day and age we, that we live in, it is so difficult to trust anything you see because uh, with with Photoshop and uh, chroma key technologies and you know After Effects and 3D software, I mean, you can fake everything. I could, if with with enough time, I could create just about anything and make you believe it's real. Yeah, I've seen your work and it's uh, pretty impressive. And um, in my opinion, you do a better job than NASA. And so. Why the the whole thing is though? Why do they have to fake it? I mean, what's what's the point if if all of what they say is true? Why the deception? Why are they having to deceive us in the way that they are? Well, that's uh, a good question, and, and I want to see how you answer this because uh, you know one of the things that people say all the time, one of their knee jerk reactions is, "Well, what's the motive? Why would they be?" Why would they lie to us about all this? So, what, what, what's your take on it? Why would why would NASA, the governments of the world, and whatnot? Why would they be if the Earth really is flat? Why lie and give us pictures of a globe? Well, I think the reason that they are perpetuating this as being the mother of all conspiracies is because science they're able to um, because they have these Ph degrees and um, so many people respect their professional opinions. Um, that they are able to separate people from belief in intelligent design. And if you can make the Earth just another one of those random circumstances, um, just another one of those planets that happens to be in the Goldilocks zone, and that that's the whole reason why life evolved um, into being, uh, then you can get people to believe that it's all just random and that there's no grand creator behind the intelligent design of it. And look at how many people have bought into that we have evolved of apes. Or that there's some missing link out there. Um, And another part of the strong delusion, in my opinion, is the whole premise that they're establishing with the ancient alien series now. uh, That the the missing link is that we were genetically created from, you know, the ancient aliens mating with um, some... Um, some one of our ape ancestors, and that's why we've not been able to discover discover this missing link. And look at how many people. I mean, this is what they're teaching in high schools and elementary and in colleges. And look at how many people have bought into this. How many scientists are atheists and have no um, belief in God at all and no belief in the Creator. And they are fully ready to bow down to these ancient aliens as our creators and our benefactors and that they're the ones that are going to come and save us and restore the Earth to um, to harmony. And um, and so that, in my opinion, is also part of the strong delusion, and that, and it also, it, if you can, because we know they worship Lucifer as the sun god and as the light bearer, and you know these Freemasonic secret societies that they worship Lucifer and they worship the sun god, and the heliocentric model. Um, it it has the sun as the as foremost, as the predominant entity of, of the supposed the solar system. The and the earth is um, demoted so to just being one of its nine subjective planets. Mm-hmm. And so all of that is 
it's and similar to their demoting of point, God and wall. their exalting of Lucifer the as the Antichrist. And that the heliocentric model um, is basically the New World Order. It's um, Satan saying, I will exalt myself above the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. And the United Nations flag, uh, you know, just like with um, in time of war, when um, an enemy is vanquished, they will raise the flag uh, to signify their defeat and their control, their conquest over them. And the United Nations being the seat of the New World Order, that's exactly what they did when they raised the flag, depicting the flat earth. Uh, they're basically laughing at the world. Oh, we're teaching them heliocentricity, but we know the truth. And they're signifying to all of those that are affiliated with their secret societies to the these... Um, Freemasonic groups worldwide, we have succeeded in um, in bringing forth Pike's vision. You know the the whole three world wars to bring on a one world order, the establishment of a one world government, and this is setting the premise for the one world religion, one world government, one world people, uh, all of that that they are trying to do in order to bring forth the Antichrist to reign over it all. And that, um, because it's not just the United Nations, it's also the International Civil Aviation Organization, the International Maritime Organization, the World Health Organization, all of them fly these flags with the depiction of the flat earth on them. Um, and so it's just their way of saying, to the, their members, their secretive groups, we have succeeded in conquest. We control these different groups, and um, because they bear our flag, and uh, it's their way of laughing at us at the same time that they're um, showing that the flat Earth is occult knowledge. Yeah, when I, I did a Facebook note a while back called "Probably Just a Coincidence," and I was. Showing that first of all, I started off with the Gleason New Standard Map of the World, 1892, which is the 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 flat Earth map. But at the top of it, it says scientifically and practically correct as it is. And you're like, I mean, this is a an official New Standard Map of the World, 1892, <laughs> and showing the flat Earth map. And as you said, all those organizations have that same logo. The one that really caught my attention though was the. Um, the uh, United Nations Business Partnership Patch. The, this is like a international business organization of some sort. The patch has the, the letters UN over the UN flag logo, the flat earth map, and right below it it says, we believe. <laughs> ah, interesting. No, I, I hadn't even seen I'll that. Send, I'll send you a link to that note. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, really? Uh, I mean, if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy... They're not helping with the logos and titles like, you know, Operation High Jump and Fishbowl, Operation Fishbowl. And, right. You know, I, you know, I just think this is a worthy topic to look into. Um, congratulations on beating most of us to the punch and <laughs> getting a book out. Uh, I'm still working on mine. But, um, and uh, thank you, by the way, for uh, sending me the first manuscript. And this is the first interview you've had on it, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I appreciate you allowing me... Because I really respect your work, and I respect your open-mindedness, and I applaud your efforts. And I think it's wise for you to be cautious, to make not jump to any conclusions, but to take your time on these matters and to really, you know, to explore every angle of the discussion. And, and in interviewing people like myself, and I know that you've um, shared this same kind of conversation with many others, I think that... All of that is setting a precedence for many people that had never even wanted to, never even opened themselves to the possibility of discussing these topics and that you're doing a great service to the kingdom because it is my belief that this is absolutely biblical. 
I share that belief for sure. It is absolutely biblical. The The challenge is proving it. And um, you know what? I'm going to continue on this quest. I would encourage everybody else out there to continue on this quest. And uh, one of the ways they can do so is checking out your new book. And uh, where can they contact you? Where can they get the book uh, if they want to know more? Uh, just go to zengarcia.com and click on the contact contact us. It'll give you my email address. Let me know that you're interested in it. Um, I'm changing just a couple things, adding just a couple things. So give it a week, and um, you can go to lulu.com because that's where it'll be published. Uh, I'm uh, published through Tate, and I'm going to give them a chance to um, to you know to carry it. But um, I haven't presented it to them yet because there's a lot of illustrations, and they're a little bit funny on that side of it, but. Um, but I will give them a chance to carry it if they so choose. And if they do, it'll be carried through tape publishing as well. Uh, well, that'd be pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, you do have to be careful with the images because uh, copyright stuff, a lot of these guys are real. Right. Uh, and you do have to be careful with that. I, I knew that when I was going into uh, publishing my first book. Tom Horn was like, yeah, you might want to change or get rid of some of these pictures because you don't want the hassle. But um well, uh, congratulations on getting this done. Uh, this is this is pretty exciting. You got thirty-two chapters here. In how? What's the page count? Two hundred and two hundred. Two hundred eighteen, and that's letter size pages. So it's eight and a half by eleven. Which, if I were to reduce it to the regular six by nine that I usually publish in, it would be uh, four hundred plus pages. Oh, this is eight and a half by eleven. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, very cool. And uh, we got about two minutes left. Uh, anything you want to say to our audience uh, before we close out tonight? Well, I just think it's important to be open-minded to topics that you don't understand and to not immediately jump to conclusions. All right. But to explore the possibilities. Right on. Thank you guys for listening. Good night, everyone. You're listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. With your host, Rob Skiba. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight we're going to uh, continue uh, dealing with a topic that may just be the mother that gave birth to the mother load of all conspiracies. That, of course, being the flat earth controversy that I've been covering for a number of months now, actually. <laughs> I can't believe I've been doing a series since uh, April, I guess. But um, my guest tonight is uh, somebody that I was actually surprised that uh, he went and jumped on the bandwagon too, and uh, I happened to catch a couple of his radio broadcast and saw that he was looking into it and uh, was taking pretty firm stance on it. My guest is Zen Garcia. He's the webmaster of the truth-seeking network called Fallen, FallenAngels.tv, whose motto is, The seeker of lost paradise may seem a fool to those who have never sought the other worlds. He also hosts a show on Revolution Radio, not to be confused with the Revolutionary Radio Project, <laughs> also on Wednesday nights uh, from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on Studio B. He's the author of seven books, Look Somewhere Different, When the Evening Dies, A Different Way of Being, Lucifer, Father of Cain, Awaken to the New World Order, Sons of God, Who We Are, Why We Are Here, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny, and the Aramaic and Palestinian Targums. And you can find his books at zengarcia.com, as well as lulu.com, and, of course, amazon.com. His radio shows are on, uh, he's got one on Blog Talk, blogtalkradio.com, forward slash Fallen Angels TV, and also on freedomslips.com. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project, not for the first time, he's been on my show before when I was on Blog Talk Radio, but for the first time here, pretty frightening, uh, and you start looking into these things and realize, wow, it is all tied together, and and inevitably, you're right, the Sumerian stuff comes up, the Babylonian stuff definitely comes up, the, the Egyptian myths, Osiris, all that comes up, and you see that there is um, a Luciferian agenda at work, and uh, the fallen angels are, are very active and have been for thousands of years. 
doing things uh, in this world. And most recently, though, we found ourselves stumbling on this subject of the flat earth. Now, what was it? Now, people who have listened to me know that I listened to a, a radio show that was done by uh, Basil and Gons called Canary Cry. They interviewed Mark Sargent, and that was sort of my introduction to the whole thing. What was yours? My listeners kept emailing me <laughs> flat earth videos. <laughs> and for the longest time, I would just have, I didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. I didn't even want to look into it. Didn't want to give any time to it because um, with with my disability, um, I try to use the time that I'm sitting in my wheelchair to be as productive as I can. Sure. And so I don't like to waste time. Um, I try to accomplish tasks that I can't do when I'm not sitting. And so I work on my books while I'm sitting up or I do research or <clears throat> I go outside and I read biblical texts, anything to be productive in, in that regard. And so I, for the longest time I avoided it. And then my listeners and some of my um, closest confidants, some of my friends who are also broadcasters, they told me that there's something to it and that I had always pushed that we should be open-minded on hmm. topics and not have, you know, any kind of... And I, I basically woke up to the New World Order and the whole conspiracy side of reality after the events of 9-11, I think it was 2004, um, that I really started digging deep into all of what you can find on the internet and realize that uh, the official story had been a lie and that what we were being told um, was not based on truth, that uh, much of what was being pushed as the official story was propaganda. And, and so what made my show and my work unique was that I was able to tie together the conspiratorial side of what's going on with the New World Order uh, with the biblical and prophetic side of um, the gospel as well as tying together the ancient mysteries and the Sumerian, Sumerian mythologies and um, the study of ancient texts from uh, around the world because I, I study it all and um, seeing the underlying theme of truth behind all of these things I put it together kind of as a puzzle and then wrote about it and presented this information um, in the different books that I've written up until this point. And um, now this, my latest book, the one that I just sent you the manuscript on, um, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch, that's the latest installment of going down the rabbit hole and um, <laughs> trying to find truth. Yeah, it sounds like we took a, a very similar path, and it's it's. I think that's what happens to people as soon as they are, their eyes are open to nine eleven. That's sort of like the gateway, <laughs> because right. as soon as you go through that and you have this paradigm shattered, that wow, you know, I haven't been told the truth, that there are people out there who are, are lying to us on a regular basis, and that evil really does exist, and uh, you know, as the saying goes, I've seen the enemy, and it's us. That's that's pretty. Um. And when uh, when I was 24 years old, I acquired a disability that really gave me the time to study and look at scriptures in a way that I never had prior. And uh, up until that point, I had been involved in reading much of what is the New Age and Sumerian mythology and all the Zechariah Sitchin books. And I was involved in shamanism at the time and doing sweat lodges and things of that nature. But um, I was brought full circle back to the scriptures, read them again with new eyes, um, started reading all of the extra-biblical, extra-canonical texts, everything that I could get my hands on. And, and, you know, the Internet was new at that time, and all you had to do was type in 
uh, a word to search out and get so much um, as far as results and gain access to all of these different books I had never heard about. And so I started reading all this material. And in the process of doing that, I kept having these different themes present themselves to me. And they were things that were not being discussed or talked about, um, things that I did not learn when I went to Sunday school and um, that the mainstream church was not talking about. And so I decided to... Um, collect all this information and started sharing it um, on radio programs. I was invited to be a guest a number of times. And then after I began doing my own broadcast in 2008, um, a lot of my listeners started asking me for the material that I had um, to, so that they could look at it with, for their own research purposes and I decided then to compile them into into books, and I've been um, publishing books on Christian themes ever since 2010. And on Truth Frequency Radio Network. Zen, are you there, sir? I am, brother. It's a great honor to join you, and um, I applaud you and all of your efforts because you have been on the forefront of this topic and you have done fantastic shows um, really single-handedly just dismantling the whole globe theory and all of the um, you know the lies and the deception that are being perpetuated by NASA and uh, with your background um, in in showing you know step by step um, how they have perpetuated this lie it's it really is. You you should be applauded for all your efforts. Well, thanks, brother. I appreciate that. I, I you know, I I have been on record as saying, look, I I'm just I got a website called Testing the Globe because that's all I'm doing. I'm a questioning globalist at this point, and I've been looking for that that one solid piece of evidence that's indisputable before I will commit to saying, okay, yeah, I'm a flat earther. I mean, people who have looked at my website, they watch my videos, they they're all convinced I'm a flat earther. I'm like, look, guys. I'm still testing this. I haven't found that one solid piece. I've found a whole lot of what I consider to be extremely compelling uh, evidences to look at. But I thought I had it, man. With that video of the the moon going across the earth, I thought for sure that was the one. But uh, I did some tests here in my office this week and I had to actually put a video out <laughs> called the Rob Skiba Debunks Rob Skiba. I had to debunk myself yeah. on it. But, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating topic. Um, to say the least, but it's also very exciting, and, and I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about it because I listened to, I think, three or f- I must have been probably four episodes that you did on the subject, and I was, uh, I was really intrigued that uh, you were on it. So uh, before we go there, let's give a little bit more of your background, though, for the sake of my listeners here that uh, probably haven't heard you on my other show. Uh, just give us a little bit more of your background other than what I, I read in your bio, if you would. Um, well, I've been seeking truth ever since I was young, 